we were really intrigued to see your you sharing your story about mental health and and it taking your leave in the in the fall and we kind of came across a meal when was this 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 was kind of right when i think we started talking about doing the podcast yeah that we saw the news about you sharing the reasons why why you took that that leave and uh, and so we, we first of all wanted to say thank you for for doing that for sharing the details of that because with this podcast and, and and with persist as a whole, we're we're really trying to you know open up the conversation about people talking about mental health and politics. So I, I just want I just wanted to say thank you for that. Yeah, big time. Yeah, I think it's something that isn't talked about enough in general, whether we're talking about politics or not. I think in <clears throat> society as Canadians uh, as someone that's indigenous my whole life is political whether I'd like it or not as soon as I'm born many of my aspects are driven by external forces many influences come from outside of the community and directly influence our community but even when we're talking about mental health and in what way that works for us. It's going to look completely different for Dale, for Emil, and for Moolah. What mental health, what it looks like in a good way for you can look totally different for me. And even in that, we need to be willing to have an open conversation of not just sitting on -on one-on-one and viewing that as saying sitting down with the therapist or a counselor, but viewing it also as ensuring people have sick leave ensuring people can take time off, ensuring people have childcare, ensuring that there are things a part of life that people shouldn't be stressed about. People shouldn't have to be worried about choosing between starting a career and starting a family. People should be able to do these things simultaneously. People shouldn't have to be in major debt because they decide to go to post-secondary because they want to contribute in whatever way, shape, or form to society. So I think even in all the ways that we talk about even just mental health, uh, I think it's something that we need to pull much farther back and be a lot more willing to talk about the big picture um, items, which in reality means individuals in day-to-day life. How is your mental health right now? How are you doing? (laughs) Much better than I, oh my goodness, I look back at even before, you know, from campaign to being elected to what it's what it means for anyone regardless of age or background to be elected into a member of parliament position regardless of whether or not they wanted to do that in their lifetime and just all the things that as always in my life (laughs) happen pretty quickly and at a usually a pretty intense pace and I find in a lot of ways I've always been ahead of my time or in a different way of of thinking than a lot of people around me in terms of being able to take a step back and look at things from a more holistic, uh, more humanized way. And also being able to take a step back and say, what is the actual problem? And looking at the why, not the what. It's not suicide it's not violence it's not death it's what contributes to that why are we in this situation it's not the turmoil of the current it's let's dissect why we are here and a lot of that goes to a lack of basic human rights where we often see turmoil and violence is where we see people fighting for keeping a roof over their head making sure that they can feed themselves and those that they love, those that they need to take care of. Where we see turmoil is where we see a lack of quality of life, a lack of basic human rights, a lack of opportunity to even be able to you know, have whatever job you might want. Uh, be able to, again, going back to that, if you're looking at being able to start a family or going to work, being able to have opportunity is something that everybody should have access to. And in that opportunity, it's mental health, availability to have resources that help yourself in whatever way is fit for you. And 
to be able to talk about it, I think just in general, in my position is something that not a lot of people see. Yeah, take it a step further to be able to talk about it in a holistic way, take it a step further and to be able to talk about my personal experiences and how they tie in with everything else and how this is not about an MP who went through a hard time. This is about a broken system and it failing so much that the representative of it has to take time off. It's not about me. It's about everything else. One of the things that I have been thinking about as I'm sure that Emil has is particularly for this conversation, we, the both of us would never understand any, any of that essentially, because we, we haven't lived where, where you have lived. But part of this kind of broader conversation is trying to, trying to figure out, you know, it, 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 trying to talk to people like you who, who have the lived experiences. And because, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't know anything about that. I've, I've lived in a fairly, you know, privileged community, you know, in the, in the places that I've lived, but so it's, it's important to get, to get a bunch of different voices like that. One of the, one of, yeah, go ahead, Emil. Yeah. So on that Mumalak, I'm wondering for the majority of listeners who don't live or even haven't been to the North and, and none of it specifically, can you describe, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm here in Vancouver, which like Dale is probably one of the more privileged places in the country, but even here access to mental health supports is, is not what it should be to your point. But I think it'd be really useful for context to kind of hear what, what that support, what those supports or lack thereof are like for residents of, of none of it. Yeah, and I, I think taking it a step back to Dale's comments, kind of not having an idea because you don't have that lived experience or that knowledge. And to that point, realistically, that's not the fault of you or me. That's the fault of our education system. That's the fault of our institutions that dictate and determine what you learn and what you don't. It's not the fault of us or yours that we are not taught Canadian history in its entirety and it in its truth the benefit that that has is solely on institutions like the federal like the RCMP when there is a lack of basic human rights and therefore it leads to violence and turmoil and death when you don't understand the purpose the cause the history behind it it's hard to understand why to be upset or why to be up frustrated or why to support a group of people that need support. Hiding that Canadian history ultimately benefits not having to fulfill those obligations of basic human rights. So for you to say you don't, you don't understand or maybe have knowledge of that experience is the fault of the federal government for not sharing that history, for denying us knowledge on feeding into the present. And, and that's you know, one of the questions I've asked while being interviewed, who does it benefit to not know our history? And the answer is no one. That's a lie. It completely benefits the federal institution because if you don't understand why I'm upset about not having basic human rights and that we should have basic human rights, then we just get to keep screaming into a void like we have been for the last 20 years because the only people really listening is the federal government and we know they're not upholding their obligation. So, you know, we are then faced with the burden of sharing our experience, our history, and being turned to and looked at as the voice for that, when really the turmoil and the colonial history behind it is not the fault of ours. And now, We're faced with an immense amount of lack of basic human rights, lack of mental health services, and now we need to turn and share our stories on this front to help get people as frustrated, to help find our support, help find our allies, because institutions like the federal government is not sharing the true history. Going into, I think, you know, that plays nicely into leading into what the norms are, what your norms have been in the South and BC, what my norms are in the North growing up, and how as Northerners, we're always expected to be able to accommodate to a Southern way of lifestyle, 
but never has the South ever been expected to be knowledgeable or maybe not accepting, but intrigued or it's always a a one way street. As Northerners, we have to navigate the Southern healthcare system for certain things. We, most post-secondary opportunities are in the South. So now we're, we're always forced into navigating systems that weren't built for the North, but are put in the North. And then when we're put in the South, there isn't this cross-cultural in in the way that it should be. It's we're always accommodating to English language, uh, Southern way of scheduling, of lifestyle, of, you know, different norms. And I can talk a little bit about that. I think some things that Canadians just typically don't think about is Nunavut is 25 fly-in, fly-out communities. So there are no, it's no road access. You have to fly <laughs> into every every community. Most communities have chucked in, chucked out uh, water and sewage. So my hometown, if you had a five-day blizzard, you had to make sure that you were able to ration your water because if the roads weren't clear, you weren't going to get your water delivered or your sewage pumped out. Things like we don't have trees and people laugh at me sometimes when I say I don't really enjoy living in the south and living around trees. But my norm is to be able to see for dozens or hundreds of kilometers as far right. as the eye can see. And now I'm in the city with all these big things around me. For me, that can feel very enclosed and it's not my norm and what I grew up in. Even things like we don't have any stoplights in the territory. We have cement roads in some communities, but most of our communities are gravel roads and and things like that. I think ultimately, though, when you think about there's permafrost, so there's no trees and everything is fly in, fly out with the exception of a barge order that comes in during the summer months that even those kinds of things and what that means in getting groceries, in going to school, in having access to different programs and sports, just that it makes the reality sometimes completely different in a lot of ways. But I think the biggest take back from that is how we're forced to accommodate a different kind of way of life. And there isn't this two-way road of, you know, a lot of Northerners and a lot of uh, Inuit understand what it's like to be in the South. And that is totally different way of living in different norms and how to accommodate, how to live in it, and also where we are from and understanding our roots. So I think the, the biggest part in that North and South, it's, it's a very one-way street. In the, in the research that I was doing for this, of course, I, I went back and watched the video from the Daughters of the Vote in 2017, when you kind of first became noticed, maybe, or a little bit more, more well-known. And I want to, I want to ask you about, about the speech that you gave. It's a short three minute speech, but at the time, just, just as a quick aside, you, you went by Trina. So I, I was surprised to, to see that name. Can you, and I know a little bit of the story on the, on the name change, but can, can you just, just tell us quickly about that? Absolutely. So I had to think of a specific time. I did my first name, my legal name is Trina. My English name is Trina. And that's what I was raised as. Everybody in my hometown knows me by Trina. In 2017, I did that speech in March. That led me to quite a few opportunities. I got to work with Susan Abdulkak for about uh, six weeks that summer, the first Enoch Juno Award winner. Mm -hmm. We started the grassroots of her Arctic Roads Foundation. I moved on for the next six weeks of that summer working with Northern Youth Abroad as a group leader organization I've been involved with for about the last 10 years. And then I moved to Ottawa, transferred to Algonquin College and started working at Inuit Tapalit Canada Me or ITK in the HR department. At the time I was going to school and the college strike had happened and I decided I could work um, full-time at ITK and tried that. And that was actually one of my realizations of not 
uh, being a fan of living around trees or I called it the concrete jungle at the time I really wanted to just go back home and be on Nunavut grounds so at that time I moved to Iqaluit and started working with the quality of life secretariats the suicide prevention aspect of the government of Nunavut it's the only kind of recognized like suicide prevention aspect in the GN there was a lot of difficult conversations a lot of realization in a lot of things and to work in a department that focuses solely on suicide prevention is something that's very difficult when sometimes like in in my hometown that year I believe we had four suicides in about five weeks and you know I I know everyone you're where you were raised with people or you were raised with you know someone's it's someone's parent or someone's cousin or so there are certain times of the year where we just kind of hold our breath because it's unfortunately repetitive so in these difficult conversations and having to really ground myself in what I was doing why it was important And to be surrounded by suicide your whole life and to not, you know, to go through training programs like assist the suicide work, a suicide prevention workshop, and to sit there and say, I don't need training. I know how to talk somebody off a ledge or from a really desperate situation or because you've been in those circumstances so many times. When I was working at QOL, I really had to ground myself because it wasn't just in my personal life so much. It was work. I worked in suicide prevention and then often I had friends who were struggling a lot and it was suicide prevention everywhere all the time for me. And in that, I really had to figure out who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And I had to figure out I had to find the best way for me to ground myself. And for me at the time, that was very much getting in touch with my family history, my culture. And it was people around me, it just made more sense to call them by their Inuktitut name rather than their English name. And then over time, people started calling me by my Inuktitut name. And it just, it was a name that was given to me by my dad when I was two or three. And it just made more and more sense in my brain that I was creating this person I was meant to become. And for me, that was going by my Inuktitut name rather than the English name. So I still had Mumilak from when I was a kid and had been called that by certain people. And, you know, it's my Inuktitut name. It always has been since I was very young. It was just it was time for me to recognize myself in the way that made sense. And for me, that was being mumilak and really taking hold of my future and saying, I'm going to help Inuit to the best of my ability and I'm going to do it with this name. That was part, part of it. Yeah. Thank you. When you, when you gave the, when you gave the speech at, at the daughters of the vote, and as I said, it's, it's three minutes and I, I watched it, shortly before we started. And I, I kind of regret watching it so close to the, when we talked, because it, it's, it's tough to watch. It's tough to listen to the, to the story, to, to the topic that you're sharing. But again, it's, it's so important. When you, did you ever consider talking, you know, it's a, I guess it would have been the equivalent of a member statement or, or, you know, something like that in the House of Commons. But did you ever consider that speech being about anything besides the suicide crisis? Or did you just know that the, that's that's what it was going to be about? That, How could I talk about anything other than that? That was the topic I chose because it affects us so much, but it yeah. wasn't the purpose of my speech. I got you. My purpose was where are the leaders? Where are all the white people that are making all these decisions for us? Where's the PM? Where's the minister? Where are leaders with power and ability to make change where are non-indigenous allies it was a call out to everyone that's not inuk because we're facing things that are so horrendous that we are 
the leader in our suicide crisis. So Mumalak, I'm assuming, and tell me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming that uh, the mental health and other health challenges that you saw in your community and in Nunavut were part of the reason that you decided to, to step up and, and run for office. I'm wondering at what point after becoming a candidate, you started to kind of wrap your head around or realize the mental health impacts that, that the role of a candidate and an elected official could have on you personally and kind of your, your journey through that realization. October 2020. (laughs) I didn't have time to think or I I didn't give myself time to think or breathe. The very end of August, I was approached by NDP's EDA in Nunavut asking if I'd be interested in running. So it was about maybe two weeks, about a week before the writ job when I actually said, okay, I'm going to run for MP. If you asked me in July of 2019, I would have laughed in your face and said, yeah, right. I'm not, I'm never touching (laughs) politics. So when I was approached, it was, okay, let me get this straight. You're asking if I'm interested in running for member of parliament for the new Democrat party here in the territory in like a week and a bit. And the yes, and I said, okay, let me talk to my mom. Let me do my research. And my mom basically said, (laughs) I said, mom, don't you understand that your crazy 25 year old daughter wants to run for this and you're fine? She was like, you do things like this all the time. (laughs) I'm not surprised. We're not surprised. We love you. We support you no matter what. So it was kind of jumping right into planning for a campaign. And then it was camp like, campaigning for uh, those six weeks and I was really 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 nutty for a long time then I got elected I didn't take two consecutive days off until July 2020 I worked Christmas I I was so engulfed in this idea of I have this position right here right now let me use it to the best of my ability but in that I really didn't take the time to stop and reflect and ground myself, check in with myself. I was just working, 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 working. And then all of these kinds of you know, pressures and not learning how to cope in a way that's healthy for me to be able to say, okay, in this position, there are pressures but there are also limitations in what I can do. There are also realistic aspects and what boundaries can be pushed. And after the the tour that I did in, in the housing tour, it's one thing to know. It's and it's a one thing to see it, but to continuously see it over three weeks in the harshest ways that I did and continuously hearing not just about homes, but a lot of death, murder, suicide, a lot of really, really intense stories that you you, want, you begin to understand why there is such high turnover, even in the barely existing mental health that is there, there is such high turnover in, in the counselors and communities that you know, people Inuit that do get trained through counseling, there's a counseling service called Ilisak Civic, for example, that trains Inuit counselors. Well, if you're going back to your hometown and you're trying to do counseling there, there's all these, you know, all these connections and all these, these things that just make it more difficult. And when there isn't that infrastructure, the buildings, the, you know, there's such an immense l- lack of things in Nunavut. We could sit here and categorize them all and list them all and talk them <laughs> through to death. And ultimately what I saw in this housing tour was just kind of over and over and over of similar situations that resulted in different outcomes. And ultimately everyone was so tired, so exhausted so run down that they wanted to talk to me about anything and everything and you know there were so many times I was stopping near arguments and calming down near fights because people are so stressed and tensed about the stresses that they're facing and what I saw ultimately 
was a result of a lack of basic human rights, resulting in stress and frustration on levels from children with skin, major skin irritations that were going to school hungry to adults that were losing their apartment for whatever reason to elders that had to move to a different community because they don't have an elder facility access. Like just so many, there's such an immense amount of issues because of a lack of one thing, because of a lack of housing infrastructure and how much that feeds into absolutely everything else. It was hard to walk into home after home and see a result of colonization and a lack of basic human rights and understand it's not the fault of the people most often that are in here. And it's a fault of a failed system. And I got to go back and I got to go back to the failed system and talk to the failed system. And they know it's a failed system. They tell us all the time, we know there's a crisis in Nunavut. We know there's the highest suicide rate. We know there's not enough homes. They keep telling us they know. And yet, where do we see change? Where do we see an actual increase in just shelter places for people to sleep? Does that access to affordable living? Does that does that frustration and hearing that all the time fit into and and did it fit into your uh, kind of downturn in in mental health? This I don't want to say uh, hopelessness, but just not just uh, hearing over and over again that we know that that things need to be changed. People in Nunavut need to be helped. You know uh, all these series of things, but at the end of the day, that you know the the needle isn't being moved at all the situation is is still the same and i would point to the like to the previous mps for nunavut they were both government members of parliament and you would of course know better better than i you know were they able to to really do that much like even even as as government members of parliament like i i would assume that you know hearing that over and over would be would be tough yeah but it's also just what we've been hearing since i was born Like it's nothing new I can, and I do, I sit there and I will, you know, kind of mock the liberals answers because you can say we are immensely, extremely interested in working with all provinces and territories in this extremely important manner. And we will make sure we work with all leaders to ensure, you know, it's just the same 15, 20 second clip that politicians are conditioned to be able to roll off their tongue. Right. I think, you know, and that's the difference in having me and having NDP in there compared to a liberal or a conservative. A liberal or conservative will never say the same things I do. It's, they're probably not allowed. They're probably given a script. You ever see me reading from a piece of paper? That's my words. That's my pen marks all over there. And yeah. I've never, ever been I've never felt the need to like I are always am so straight up with Jagmeet if I ever have a concern there's I never feel like I'm being pushed to the back or like my voice is less of a you know if I have a concern I approach my leadership with it and I'm taken seriously and we do something about it and you can look at the history you know like you say you look at the other the previous Nunavut MPs, I don't know if you can say that they were able to do that to even have a real question or statement. And you can see, I ask about truthful things. Previously, you can tell that it's most likely a set of question. It's most likely, you know, I call them bench warmers. I call them, and you just look, just look at the liberals. When do they put any of the indigenous or the any of the racialized MPs up? Yeah, it's usually when they're asking their liberal question to the liberal minister, and it's like, "What are you doing in my neck of the woods?" Right. And they basically say, "We're doing all these great things, yeah. even if it's not all that great." And to have at least me there, I at least get to say, and I can 
stand there and say, I'm standing in an institution that was meant to kill me. Do you think any other member from any other party would be able to say that under their leadership? I think not. Right. But yeah, that... I'm able to just say it exactly how it is because that's how NDP rolls. Yeah, that was that was one thing that I, I saw that you had said that you with with Jugmeet, you're able to just be yourself. And I I for the reasons that you just outlined. I don't, that's not a common thing in politics, particularly in our, in, in our political party system. Mumalak, in the, the video, the really moving video you, you put out when you came back from your leave, you talked about a couple of things that I'm, that I'm hoping we can touch on with the time we have left. One is you mentioned uh, your wellness plan. We'd love to, to kind of hear more about that. And you also made a reference to, and, and I wrote down the exact quote, to, to how politics can look, feel, and be different. I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about what that means to you. I always have my few little sayings. One's always stay tuned, stay with me, stay updated, <laughs> and politics can look, feel, and be different. Yeah. Uh, for me, that's just, it means it can look like you. It can look like me. It can look like all of us. And in order for it to feel different, it has to be different. But I think that means being able to, the first conversation one of the first conversations I had before kind of jumping into campaign was with a good friend. And I said, I'm worried that politics will ruin the foundation of who I am. Mm. And I had a really intense conversation where I said, I don't want to turn into a robot that knows the 15, 30 second clips, the person that walks around in a suit all the time and thinks that I'm have more of a spot than my constituents or that my spot at the table is more meaningful than others because of whatever position I'm in or whatever meeting I'm in. I didn't want it to basically mess with my head to make me feel inferior or, or, or more or that for some reason, because as a member of parliament representing people that me as an individual had more of a spot. I wanted to make sure I stayed humble. I wanted to make sure I stayed in in who I was and even the way I dressed. I refused to wear a blazer because it just that's not who I am. And and not just you know in in I would just never wear a blazer in my life. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't so why would I put one on now that I'm a politician? Politics can look, feel, and be different because it can look, feel, and be like me. And that means it can look, feel, and be like anyone else. And I think the trickle effect of even just saying that really instills in people that it, it can be. Yeah, when I came back with the, you know, needing some sort of wellness plan and I think it that really knocked me on my behind that housing tour and working that much and you know that was it was about a year of working crazy amount of hours crazy amounts of time crazy amounts of stretches like six weeks a campaign oh my goodness every day was about 14 16 hours and then being elected and just kind of never stopping I needed to be able to you know and and it, and it did get to a point where it was I it was medical leave I had to take that time off because it was I don't know what happens after that and the answer was probably body shut down and that's how much I had worked myself into a state where I really needed rest so the doctor was really persistent on how I probably need much more than two months off and to not be stubborn and to not rush and to just take my time. And I'm a very, very stubborn individual. I ended up taking 10 weeks off, but really making sure that I had a really concrete plan when I came back and being really open and transparent with my party as always. But for me, it was more, what am I going to say to the public? that was what freaked me out the most i could deal with everything else and i and i did develop uh, and still have kind of my yeah wellness plan i do i have trauma informed counseling twice a week with a counselor that i used to have 
from when I worked with the Quality of Life Secretariat in Suicide Prevention. I had a gradual back to work, so I only worked a certain amount of time for the first few weeks. We had a steady HR plan because of my specific barriers with my constituency office. It's been really hard to hire staff and my party has been trying to work really hard with the board of board of internal economy to get that changed. So there are all these kinds of things that happen through the party. And then in my personal space, I had decided to move to a bigger spot and take up I put down work in the evenings now at a specific time I turn off my phone I do a lot of beading and sewing decided to repaint the deck I'm a very DIY person and if I want to do something I just do it I get tired of waiting and I'm very impatient so if I want to see something done I just do it myself so you're much more handy than me I would I would never (laughs) paint my own deck ever what a nightmare that would be (laughs) And of course, I think I can get it done in a little while, but I sand it down and then water pressure and then took off the Latisse and now I'm looking at other stuff and repainting it and it looks great, but I'm a very hands-on person. (laughs) You know, I think a member of parliament taking mental health leave, it shouldn't be a brave thing, but I think you doing that was. Yeah. And I think the reason why we think that way is that I think we are, especially those of us who work in or have worked in politics, we're, we're attuned to think that our constituents are going to give us shit for taking any kind of quote unquote time off, even though it is a, you know, it, it, mental health leave, it's a, it's a medical leave, as you said. So I, I guess in saying that, how was the response from, from your constituents in that regard? And with your colleagues on the, you know, at, on the Hill, do you think that that has moved the needle with them in terms of like, did any come up to you and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to be more thoughtful about my own situation. And if I am not doing that good, I'm going to, I'm going to take some time. In terms of people in the territory, I think there was a lot of support. I think it was also just overall an interesting time as well. The way it's kind of viewed in the territory for whatever reason is kind of you know, the premier, the Nunavut Dungavik Incorporated president, and then the member of parliament. For whatever reason, the those decision, other two decision makers are equivalent are viewed in a lot of people's minds as equivalent to the member of parliament. So when I went on that housing tour, a lot of people thought that I could give them a new home instantly, even though my job is advocating at the, in Ottawa, at the federal level. I have no, as a member of parliament, I have zero money decision-making power, absolutely none. For whatever reason in the territory, it's been kind of always viewed as the MP having some sort of intense decision making power even though that's never been the situation so <laughs> we had a couple interesting instances where Nunatsiat News came out and said no, what's Nunavut's what's Nunavut's plan while the MPs off work that got people a little bit riled up but then there was a second article which really painted a picture of my office wasn't answering anything and that wasn't true. It really painted a picture of us not being engaging with Nunavut, which wasn't true. And it was right at the time of Christmas break, which no MPs were working anyways, but it really almost start, started the conversation of if she's not in there, why should we keep her in there? And then, you know, Chris or New Year's comes around and things kind of get a little bit quieter, but there was definitely a point of time where people were we're not happy which is really interesting in itself because you know at up until that point I'd spoken in the house at least five times whereas you know there are still members who in October of 2020 they're standing up and saying this is my first time speaking in the house so I'd already spoke on Hansard probably more than you know the previous Nunavut MPs had I'd just done the housing tour Jagmeet was up the first few weeks after being elected. I'd already traveled back and forth through the territory a lot. So I'd already been a lot more visible than the 
previous members were, had already probably spoke more in the House, have been more engaged with constituents. So it also kind of just is set up for my experience. So if I'm going, 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 and then all of a sudden I'm stopping, well then, oh no, what's wrong? What changed? Maybe we should get somebody else in there without taking consideration into all the things that I may have already done up until that point compared to previous members. So I think there's people aren't necessarily as aware in the North as they may be in the South of how even like party system, Nunavut, typically people are more going to vote more so on the individual, not necessarily party affiliation, but who that individual is with that party. It's not so much, oh, I'm going to vote for conservatives, NDPs, or liberals, no matter what. Although, of course, that does happen. But more often, it's people look at the individual rather than the party. Right. Are you optimistic that with more young people like you getting in, into politics and getting elected, like one of, one of the things that I think that we have found talking with people is that this conversation about mental health, it, 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 it is generational. And of course, you know, older people are, I think, t- starting to talk about it more. But are you optimistic that as, as more, you know, younger people like you get into politics, that this conversation is is going to expand more and, the, and will be more attuned to how to improve mental health in particular? I think there's room for all different kinds of people. I think, though... If it's done in a meaningful way, Mm. often what we see is an idea of including youth, but whether or not we actually do it is something that's different. I've been involved with a program called Northern Youth Abroad since 2010. Uh, It's a program that brings youth from Nunavut and NWT down south for work and volunteer experience. And they have three phases of the program. One, you do a work placement here in Canada, another one you do internationally, and then the third is kind of like a mini college course, if you will. But it's all based off goal setting, on healthy coping skills, on being able to develop abilities and skills that, I guess, life, life skills in a way that's not approached as often people when they work with northern youth or indigenous youth they very much have a savior mentality oh we need to help we need Mm. to we need to be there for these poor people (laughs) and that's not at all what this this program just provides the opportunity and a helping guiding hand if you will the the approach and and i absolutely love the program but when you work with youth there's I think a certain level of engagement you need to have and you need to also allow responsibility and you need to give it to them willingly and you need to also tell them that they can, they can do it and they can come up with the solutions and give them the space to do that and really like really give them the space to do it. I think that adults aren't good at (laughs) engaging youth, aren't good at listening are really really bad at listening is probably i think one of the biggest issues so yes the more we see youth involved in meaningful positions where their voices can be heard because i'm a member of parliament my voice is just as much as another member of parliament i can sit in a meeting you know Mm -hmm. with jagmeet and we're colleagues whereas you know if i was a youth maybe working in an office on the Hill, I'm not going to have the same credibility as viewed as a member of parliament. So yes, having youth involved more and more in politics, but involved in decision-making spots, not in spots that doesn't provide responsibility or provide opportunity to make decisions in ways that are meaningful, are engaging, are they are making decisions for themselves and us, are they're gaining that responsibility. I think that's that's how we'll see change as long as we see it at, at those levels. Right. Do you 
do you plan to run again in the in the next election? I know yeah. that you were asked this a little while ago, and your your decision was kind of up in the air still. Are you going to yes, run? I do. Great. I'm, the I, most, I, I'm these happy guys to not hear giving that. me enough time. I need more time. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to hear that because yeah. I think I think your voice is is important. Mumalak, you've been so generous with your time and uh, and just want to thank you again for for sharing your story with us and, and more broadly as well. It's it's such an important one. Maybe I'll I'll just ask this. You, you know, you in your Daughters of the Vote speech, you you asked that question around where are our allies? Is there anything that folks that are listening to this can do or read or listen to to better understand what people in Nunavut are up against and and how they can play a role in in making things better? So I would suggest the QTC or the Qikidani Truth Commission. It's kind of like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, except Mm. it's specific to the Baffin Baffin region. In 2010, the Makavik Corporation in Nunavik called on the federal government to investigate into the dog slaughters. RCMP went to go investigate RCMP. And as you would suspect, nothing was found. So Makavik teamed up with QIA and they ended up having this commission report or this report come out. And it talks specifically to 13 communities in Nunavut and the history. And it just helps give a more clear, broad understanding of how the federal government forced Inuit to lean on them and forced Inuit into positions that now Inuit are stuck in. Uh, It also does a really good job at sharing the stories and has interviews from elders that are translated and just really gives a good piece of insight to what that history uh, looked like in those communities. Of course, always following my pages and my favorite staying tuned, stay with me, stay updated. And then we do have our housing petition that's up. We have a number of things that will be coming out here over the next few weeks. I would suggest the Tritani Truth Commission for sure. QTC must read everyone. Awesome. Good to know. Appreciate that. Well, thank thank you for joining us again. Really appreciate it. This is this can be some some heavy stuff to talk about, but it's yeah. it's it's why we're doing podcasts like this to have guests like you on. So thanks for thanks for being with us and and take care and good luck in Ottawa. Thank you. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye now. Take care.